It takes a lot of courage to do that. It takes a lot of courage to do that. Well, as we're uh, getting ready here, I'll go ahead and reintroduce myself just in case anybody wasn't here a couple minutes ago. Um, I'm a grateful believer in the power of Jesus, and I personally work a program for codependency, for fear, for emotional eating, for tech addiction, and all sorts of other stuff, and my name is Trevor. Hey, Trevor. Hey, everybody. Great to see you guys. All right, so we, um, if you're new to Celebrate Recovery, here's what we try to do every single Monday night. We have a couple songs that we sing that's called Worship. If you're part of a religious tradition, it helps, us connect, uh, it helps connect us to God's power. Then we do a little bit of a lesson before we break up into small groups. Now, the real key to recovery and to finding real life change, because this program, yes, it's for addicts, but it's not just for addicts. It's for anybody who has a hurt, a habit, or a hang-up, or really is anybody who's just looking for a better way to do life. This program works best when you sit in a row first, but mainly when you go get in a circle with other people and you get to know other folks and you get to be known by other folks. So we'll do a little lesson, we'll send everybody off to groups, and then we'll have some delicious dessert and treats afterward, which is not always my favorite part. My favorite part's the life change, and my second favorite part is the donuts. So, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay, so uh, what we're doing here today, this is our fifth Monday. And so uh, usually what we do every month is we have two lessons and two testimonies. And if there's a month with a fifth Monday, we kind of get a free card to do whatever we want. And so I want to talk to you tonight. It's not necessarily based on one of the steps. I want to talk to you tonight about how to obey an impossible command. How to obey impossible commands. Now this month we have been talking about the fourth step and the fourth principle celebrate recovery. So we're going to put first up the fourth step up here. And this is the fourth step of the 12 steps that's renowned in every recovery program that um, millions upon millions upon millions of people have found freedom from whatever they're looking for help with. And so this is step four here. Let's read this out loud all together. Ready? Go. We made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. And here's principle four of the eight principles of Celebrate Recovery that correlate with the 12 steps. And it says this here. Let's read it together. We openly examined and confessed my faults to myself, to God, and to someone I trust. So if you're new here tonight, this is what we're talking about from the stage and the lessons. This is where we're at in the year. I want to zoom out here tonight and not talk about one step in particular, one principle in particular, but what God can do for any person's life. We're just going to talk broadly about recovery tonight. And here's how I want to start. I want to start with talking about pools. It is going to be May this week. Summer is coming, which means it is pool season. Anybody here love to swim? Yeah, we live in Florida. If you didn't raise your hand, hmm, shoot, I don't know about you. I don't know. So um, I want you to turn to your neighbor, and I want you to take one minute. Even if you don't know the person next to you, if you're new, like I don't talk to people, just humor me for one minute. I want you to think about your favorite pool in the whole world and talk to them about it for one minute. Ready? Go. Even if it's a... Big bird pool when you're a kid. I don't care. What's your favorite pool? Make sure everyone's getting to talk with somebody. Look at people in front of you or behind you. Don't leave anybody out. All right, another 20 seconds. And time. All right, everyone get to talk about your favorite pool? Everyone get to talk about your favorite pool? Yeah, all right. All right, I want to tell you about my favorite pool. My favorite pool is not in the state of Florida. I know. So um, I actually was born in Seattle. I don't know how I went from Seattle to South Florida. I literally went like catty corner across the country. I was born in Seattle. My dad's job took our family from Seattle to go be in, um, in a suburb of Denver, Colorado, in Aurora, Colorado. Anybody here ever been to Aurora? Yeah, a couple of you, yeah. So I was there when it was just a few neighborhoods and a lot of prairie, and uh, before it got developed like crazy. This was the house I went on Google Maps, and I found my old house. This is the house that my family lived in. Uh, for just a few years in Aurora, Colorado. Now, this was the sweetest house ever, not because of something amazing about the house, but it's because of what was across the street from the house. Think about this. You're in Colorado. Half the year, it's snowing. It's a desert. 
And then right across the street from my house was this. Ooh, it was like our own personal pool. But it was the neighborhood pool. Our neighborhood had a pool. Oh, it was the best thing ever. This is the pool where I learned to swim. This is where I had countless birthday parties. It felt like every single day of the summer, I lived on the patio of this pool with popsicle sticks and ice cream trucks driving by. It was like perfect summertime. In fact, I brought a picture of me as a little kid by this pool. Here's me as a little boy. My beard came in the next week. So this is me as a little boy by this pool, and um, I learned to swim here, had all sorts of parties here. I loved this pool. I love this pool. So much of my favorite things. And I want to talk to you tonight. You can take me off the screen. Thanks, guys. Um, uh, I want to talk to you tonight about my favorite pool in the Bible. Now, we talk mostly about recovery here on Monday nights. Um, We want to be recovery-focused, and we focus on usually a scripture to help us understand how the power of God can help you in your recovery journey. And so when I'm talking about a pool tonight from the Bible, I'm not just here as a preacher. I'm here to talk about recovery specifically. And my favorite pool from the Bible happens to also be my favorite passage in the Bible about recovery. Now, what's interesting, what's different about probably the pool you talked about, the pool I talked about, is I have happy memories about my pool. The pool I'm going to show you in just a moment isn't a happy pool. It's a sad and depressing pool. It's a place of kind of darkness and heaviness. And you might be asking me, well, why is this your favorite? And why are you going to talk to us about something sad and depressing? I could use a little bit of hope. Isn't that the name of this church, by the way? It is. And I'm here to tell you, It's perfect because it's sad and heavy and depressing because that's exactly where Jesus shows up. And so if you came in here in a heavy or a sad or depressed or broken spot, I have good news for you. Jesus has come to show up right where you're at and to give you hope. So this story comes from John chapter 5. Now, normally, if you've been with us the past couple months, I read like a verse or two a night. I'm going to read a short story that I'm just going to take us through the whole story And how it could apply to you. It comes from John chapter 5. So we're going to put up John chapter 5 verses 1 through 3. And so it says here. So this is one of the gospels. This is one of the um, the, the biographies of the life of Jesus. Jesus' best friend John wrote this. It said, sometime later Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate a pool. There it is. Ha ha. A pool. Which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. Do we have something named Bethesda in our town? That's right, Bethesda Hospital, because a healing happened here by the pool of Bethesda. So it's called Bethesda, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. And next verse, there we go. And here a great number, and here's what's really interesting and fascinating about this. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. This is a very interesting scene. Why were all these people who were disabled. I mean, in the ancient world, if you were disabled, there was no hope. There was no thought of accessibility, no thought of inclusion. Um, you, your life was over. Your life was over. And so why did all these people who were disabled lie around by this pool? Well, actually, you could go there today if you want. Here's a picture of where archaeologists found the Pool of Bethesda. It was right around here in this region. This is some where archaeologists have recovered different parts of Jerusalem. This is what it looks like today. This place is a real place. This is not a fairy tale. This is not a myth. This is absolutely real, and this is what it looks like. And what people did when they were around this pool, if they were paralyzed, they didn't have wheelchairs, or they didn't have braces, they didn't have other things to help them out necessarily like that. They had mats. Do you all like my yoga mat? It's not mine. It's a friend of mine. And uh, so it is. I do have a yoga mat at my house. I forgot it. And because we practice anonymity, I'm not going to name my friend's name and say thank you, but you know who you are. Thank you for lending me your yoga mat. And so what people would do with these yoga mats, or <laughs> with mats that have yoga mats, years ago, they would lay, oh, am I going to be able to get up after this? I don't know. I'm going to fall asleep. They would lay on this mat, or they would sit on this mat, and they wouldn't be able to go anywhere next to the pool. Now, is this just some cruel, weird, ancient world pool chair? 
No, it's not. Why in the world would they lay there? Well, tradition had it that this pool, they believed somehow mythically and supernaturally, occasionally an angel would come and stir the water of the pool. And when they saw the water being stirred, the first person to jump in the water would get healed, but only the first person. So why don't you just think about the scene in your head? Which, like, there's nothing in the Bible that says that was real. That was just a myth that people believed at the time. So paint yourself in that scene. You're disabled. You're struggling. You're hurting. You're probably abandoned by your family. If you, you don't have anybody to take care of you. And your only hope is to jump at a magic pool. But only when the water moves. So there is a bunch of people all around this pool. Just staring at the water all day, every day, forever in their desperation. And they're not only just watching in their desperation, they're in competition with everyone around. So it's not like they have a community of the disabled who could support each other in their suffering. They're in competition with each other because it's only the first person who gets in the water gets healed. And so really, when you think about it, the sickest and most disabled and most broken people there are the ones with the least amount of hope because they're the ones who have the worst shot to get in the water. Depressing and dark, right? Yeah. Let's keep going. Verse, um, verse five. If you want to where verse four went, it's in the footnotes. It's a long story. You'll see. It's uh, archaeology and all that other stuff. So, um, Verse 5, one who was there who had been an invalid, a disabled person, for 38 years. I turned 40 last year. 40 is the new 20, that's right, it's okay. <laughs> so almost as long as I've been alive, this person was disabled and broken. God, that's such a long time to be sitting by a pool. Been an, been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, and learned that he had been in this, in this condition for a long time because he couldn't get in the water, remember? He asked him, do you want to get well? I mean, that's like the most duh question ever. Thank you, Captain Obvious Jesus, for this. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get better? Duh, why do you think I'm here? Do you think this place is Disney World? No, of course I want to get better. If I was the person who's laying there on the mat, I'd probably have been offended by Jesus even asking there, even suggesting, what do you mean? Do I want to get better? Of course I want to get better. Are you crazy? What's wrong with you? And the beautiful thing is that here tonight, I don't know what pool you're laying by, but Jesus has come here tonight and to look at you too and to look at me too and say to us, do you want to get better? You want a better way to do life. And predictably, the guy gets upset at Jesus in verse 7. He says, sir, the invalid replied. I'm surprised he didn't cuss him out first. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Now, some people across the centuries have read this passage, and I think they've read it the wrong way, and they've read it like this guy was making excuses. And they shamed him and blamed him over the centuries. Like, can you believe this? Jesus comes in and says, do you want to get better? And he makes excuses to Jesus instead of just saying yes. And I totally don't believe that at all. I think this is his brokenhearted response to Jesus, where he's telling him, Jesus, I'm trying. I'm trying. What do you mean do you all want to get better? I'm trying as hard as I can, and I can't. What area of your life where you're looking for a better way to do life that somebody just looked at you and said, well, just stop it? And you're like, I'm trying to stop drinking. I'm trying to manage my codependency. I'm trying to not look at porn. 
I'm trying not to be a rageaholic. I'm trying not to shoot up. I'm trying not to buy. I'm trying not to gamble. I'm trying. I'm trying, man. I wonder how many of us ever felt that way. Imagine a lot of us. We were trying and just wasn't ever enough. You know what it is when people are saying, I'm trying? That's human willpower. And human willpower can be good for some things. I went on Amazon today, and I counted how many categories of self-help books there are for sale on Amazon. Do you know how many different categories of self-help books there are? Somebody, let somebody give a shout out. With that way, well, you overshot it. Okay, Tw- 28. 28 different categories for self-help books. And for some things, you can help yourself. And that's good. And you should. That is good. That is a good thing to do. And then there are some things where self-help just isn't going to cut it. No matter how hard you try. I remember um, in my own story with compulsive behaviors and other stuff that I was trying to manage... Sometimes I'd write a permanent marker on myself. Stop. Sometimes I would get a rubber band and snap myself every time I had a compulsive thought. I sometimes I made promises to God. And sometimes I made promises to other people. And I tried and I tried and I tried and I tried and tried. And did that help anything at all? No. It didn't. It didn't. I think we all know this too, that there are some areas of life We're just trying doesn't cut it, and it's more powerful than me. And we feel trapped and broken, and we look brokenhearted at God and at anybody else who tells us, well, why don't you want to get better? I've been trying for 38 years, man. And then a beautiful thing happens in this story. It's my favorite part, maybe of the whole Gospel of John. If it wasn't for Jesus rising from the dead at the end of the story, this is my favorite verse in the entire book. Check this out here. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. Watch this. If you take this out of context... This might be the cruelest thing Jesus has ever said to somebody ever. Get up. Pick up your mat and walk. He literally could not. Physically unable to do it. And you have things in your life that on your own you can not do. But here's the best part of Jesus. Jesus. He gives him an impossible command. But when Jesus tells you to do something, he gives you the power to do the impossible. And you can carry out an impossible command. You can get clean. You can get sober. You can get free. You can forgive. You can break free from the past You can break that habitual pattern that you can't stop that's been generational in your family. You can break it, but not on your own, but because of the person who's telling you to do it. Now, instead of me trying to explain this to you, I'm going to show it to you. Anybody here ever seen the show The Chosen? It's a TV show about the life of Jesus that's streaming online. I want to show you this scene here. Can we play this? Shalom. Me? Yes. Shalom. I have a question for you. For me. I don't have many answers, but I'm listening. Do you want to be healed? Who are you? We'll get to that later. But my question remains. Will you take me to the water? (laughs) 
Look, I'm having a really bad day. You've been having a bad day for a long time. So? Sir, I have no one to help me into the water when it's stirred up. And when I do get close, the others step down in front of me. And so... Look at me. Look at me. That's not what I asked. I'm not asking you about who's helping you or who's not helping or who's getting in your way. I'm asking about you. <laughs> I've tried. For a long time, I know. And you don't want false hope again, I understand. But this pool, it has nothing for you. It means nothing. And you know it. But you're still here. Why? I don't know. You don't need this pool. You only need me. So, do you want to be healed? So let's go. Get up. Pick up your mat. And walk. Free to walk, like he said. Don't forget your bed. Why does this matter? Because you're not coming back here. That life is over. Everything changes now. What's your mat that you came in here with today? Some of you picked it up a long time ago and been walking in freedom. And some of you have one to pick up tonight. And Jesus will change everything if you let him. But you gotta let him. So here's the whole point of tonight. You gotta stop trying to get in the pool. You gotta quit trying to get in the pool. You got to start focusing on receiving power from God. And that's what the 12 steps will do for you if you follow him. Amen. All right, so what we've been practicing here is we give you a tool every week so you can start practicing immediately what we're talking about. And we give questions for group. Here's your tool for tonight. Pick up a chip. It's chip night. We're going to pick up some chips here in just a moment as a sign of stepping into recovery. And here's our questions for group. Go ahead and grab out your phone. You can take a picture of me, but not anybody else. Take a picture of these. Here's our questions for a small group. What areas of my life was I trying to get in the pool? And what did I try before that didn't work? And what is working for me now? We'll talk about that in group. 
So I'd like to invite our Chip Hug.